Uh, good afternoon, welcome. Uh, mm -hmm. My name is uh, Eric Robbins. I'm an attorney and economic consultant. Uh, partner with a firm called Clara Consulting uh, here in the Virginia area. I also do some uh, legal work specializing in real estate infrastructure. Uh, and I primarily split my time between Washington, D.C. and Ukraine. Uh, I also am a student at IWP. Uh, Primarily focusing on studying Russian language, primarily. Um, but for those of you who don't, for those of you who are new to IWP, we are a graduate school of national security and international affairs. Uh, we offer five master's degree programs and several graduate certificates. Uh, and I'm pleased, and we're pleased to welcome today the Ambassador uh, Tumori uh, Yakovashvili. I'm not so good with the pronunciation of last names usually. Uh, for remarks on Russia, Russian policy uh, in its neighborhood. This lecture is co-sponsored by the Center for uh, Intermarium Studies at IWP. Uh, the ambassador is the executive vice president at PASS LLC, so I've gotten to know him. Uh, it's a consultancy uh, firm in the D.C. area, primarily Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, he is himself, he is the uh, he's executive president. He also is a co-founder and president of the new uh, International Leadership Institute. He's a career diplomat who has held various positions in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Georgia, including that of a director of the Department for uh, U.S., Canada, and Latin America. Previously, he was a deputy prime minister and state minister for reintegration in the government of Georgia and served as an ambassador of Georgia to the U.S. Uh, the ambassador is a graduate of... Uh, Tbilisi State University and has fulfilled uh, uh, training and fellowships at Oxford University Center of Political and Diplomatic Studies, Yale University, and Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. Uh, please uh, welcome uh, Ambassador Yakov so, Yak Bashvili. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your time because I understand that uh, evening of the Friday is holy uh, <laughs> and you are still here so it speaks loudly. Uh, I also have to try to speak loudly as well um, about a you know, subject that is um, pretty much part of my life. It's not something that I've studied or had uh, some affiliation, it's pretty much a story of my life or many lives around which. So we, before we will dig into the details and we will go to the detailed discussions, I think it's very important to uh, figure out a couple of uh, perceptions from the very beginning and what these perceptions uh, are and if they are right or wrong. Uh, number one perception is that we are operating in a post-Westphalian world, which means that the you know, nation states are the ingredients of the international system, so after the um, collapse of the empires, you know, this empire transformed into the nation states and former colonies are also aspiring or working to be a nation states. That's assumption number one. Assumption number two uh, would be that um, uh, we are um, operating in the world when every nation or the citizens of the nation have their own interests primarily, and then it comes to interests of the anybody else. So patriotism is understood as you know our collective interests, uh, and in that collective interest, my interest should be well addressed, and that's why we elect a certain government who so is going to address for us those issues. And the third assumption uh, is that when we talk about Russia of today. The reference point that we are using is the Soviet Union. So there was a Soviet Union, now we have Russia, and everything else that we discuss is comparing Russia with the Soviet Union. This try to revive the Soviet Union, etc. Why I'm mentioning these uh, assumptions? Uh, because I think when we talk about modern Russia, all three are unethical or somehow not really fitting into the Russian reality. And I'll try to explain why. First of all, um, 
There is a very interesting article of Richard Pipes, who wrote after the collapse of the Soviet Union, underlining very interesting fact that after the collapse of um, empires, after World War I, uh, what actually happened that former empires uh, shrank into the, their original size. You know, France, there was a French empire, then now we have a France as a nation state, there was a Portuguese empire, Spanish empire, and it um, uh, transformed into the more or less original size, and um, now we know these countries as a nation states. There were three empires that did not, or almost did not, or three empires that never existed prior to be an empire as a nation state, or some form of nation state. But it was a Austro-Persian Empire, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, which completely disappeared. I mean, we don't have like, one country after it. We have multiple countries, right? In Austria and Balkans. Uh, there was an Ottoman Empire who transformed into the modern Turkey, thanks to Ataturk. And there is a Russian Empire that never existed as a country called Russia. There was a place called Moscovia, uh, but it never really transformed into nation state, or didn't disappear, it transformed into what we know the Soviet Union. So when Soviet Union collapsed as a form of empire, it created a big confusion in Russia that is what we call the Russian Federation, it's an original form, this is what it's supposed to be, or not really. So that confusion is manifested if you are a Russia watcher in many, many things. And if you want to understand what Russia is trying to do in the neighborhood, we have to understand how Russians themselves see themselves and how they identify themselves in the larger world. And because of this specific uh, history of Russia, that it did not exist as a nation state, it was created, elements of the state were created by Vikings, the Norse, uh, the uh, Rurics. Then we, it was a part of the Golden Horde, and you, even today you can see some resemblance of in governance and in many affairs of the that period of time, the Mongols, the Mongol Empire, uh, then it was somehow Europeanized and governed by European rulers like the Catherine the Great, and after Peter the Great opened the window towards the, the Europe, so obviously the serious European influence, uh, influence came in. But, uh, you know, origins of Russia, which is a very much disputed uh, story, and um, we all know now that uh, uh, major author of the Russian history, the Karamzin, was one of the writers who was uh, commissioned to write the Russian history. And we know that he fabricated it very successfully. There were a number of these uh, uh, authors, but for whatever reasons, I don't know why exactly, his version found the most sympathetic ear in Russia. So when Russians are talking about their history, they're talking about history that Karamzin wrote for them, which uh, is a very loose combination of the Ukrainian history, uh, blended with uh, stories from the Golden Horde. And there are a lot of historic inaccuracies in personalities, in historic data, and etc. and etc. Um, historic events, uh, uh, and I will not go into details of that uh, because it's a very much disputed story. But it comes to basic notion that what Russians consider uh, their motherland. What is it? You know the major joke, one of the funniest joke and not very funny, actually, joke in Soviet Union was that there was a question, which country Soviet Union borders with? And the right answer was whichever it chose to. <laughs> so when you are talking to Russians and say, where are your borders? You know, where you start, where you end, 
There's no clear answer. Because different personalities will give you different answers. One of them will say, Ukraine is pretty much part of Russia. You know, come on, we are brothers, big brother, small brother. It's a one nation. Uh, some people will say, no, no, the Caucasus is not really ours. I mean, we had to occupy it for whatever reason. And etc. and etc. So there is no consensus. What is your homeland? And how it's manifested is even more interesting. Russians are, uh, you know, struggling, and it's not a new story. They started to struggle with these identity issues, starting from uh, collapse of the Russian Empire. There was a huge literature written by Russians in exile about what Russia is supposed to be. Uh, these writings now are coming back and we know them as a Eurasianist thoughts that they were saying that Russia is neither Europe, not Asia, but a combination of hybrid of these two and is a Eurasia. So this ideas of Eurasianism is not a new idea. It's a pretty much hundred years old ideas that Russians were contemplating in the beginning of the 20th century. And then, you know, very interesting developments. For example, Russian uh, government TV station had an opinion polling. Who was the biggest historic figure in the Russian history? You know, our national hero, okay? And when they realized that Stalin is winning, <laughs> they had to rig it and uh, say that the Alexander Nevsky is the biggest historic figure. Now, Alexander Nevsky himself is a very controversial figure because you know, some sources claim that he was a representative of Golden Horde in that part of the world. And events that in Russian historiography is described, but by that time he was only seven years old living in Samarkand or Bukhara or somewhere else. Uh, so, there is no consensus with who is your historic figure. And that's a kind of basics for every nation, right? Uh, if I ask to, I don't know, Ukrainians or Georgians or Albanians or whoever, you know, they will come with one, two, three big names. In Russia, it's a problematic story. Then you see the evolution of all sorts of the projects, uh, so-called Ruski Mir, which translates to Russian world which is a very loose understanding of uh, what the Russia is, that it's not only Russian Federation, but anybody else who speaks Russian or shares our values. All so-called skrepe, which loosely translated as clips, but it's a kind of glues that keep nation together. They're still now, as we speak, discussing what keeps them together as a nation. Um, all these projects of so-called liberal empire. What the hell is a liberal empire? You know that uh, in the every uh, early 90s was a very popular uh, story in Russia. Then mocking uh, European Union and NATO, creating Eurasian Economic Union, creating Eurasian Customs Union, creating uh, a collective security treaty organization modeled after NATO, and etc. and etc. So what I want to say that if you have a serious identity crisis. This definitely is translated into your foreign policy, especially in your neighborhood, because then your neighbors become kind of <coughs> questionable places. Are they independent countries or temporarily independent countries or they're part of Russia or should be part of Russia? And how we deal with them? I think that the only person in America that figured out it in early days was the George Kennan, who said that Russia can tolerate on his neighborhood either vassals or enemies. There is no other choice. Either you should be a Russian vassal or Russian enemy. And if you look at the Russian history, it's a pretty consistent policy. And when I'm talking about Russian history, here's the catch. Russian policy has been consistent and not understood in the West since the Catherine the Great. Since the Catherine the Great, Russia has the same foreign policy agenda 
and everything else fits in that agenda. And that foreign policy agenda is pretty much as Germans kind of claim as uh, geopolitical in classical Mackindarian geopolitics, Rinland, Hartland kind of sorts. Those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, there was a guy called Mackinder who wrote this theory, there are many others, now there is a Dugin who is talking about it, that there are two kinds of countries in the world. You know, Hartland, the countries that are big territorial masses that do not necessarily have access to the sea or ocean, and uh, island countries that are mostly surrounded by the sea, like Great Britain, like the United States. Because threat perception differs very much. So if your neighbors are Canadians, Mexicans, you know, this ocean, that ocean, that's a different story when you have five neighbors that historically you are quarreling with them and you have cleavages, you know, this is mine, this is yours. So the threat perception is different because countries that are so-called the Rimland, you know, Japan, the peninsula countries, they have to go somewhere to conquer. It's an expeditionary warfare, or if somebody wants to conquer them, has to come from somewhere over the seas. And when for the heartland, it's very much territorial. You expand territory from this territory, you know, moving further or moving back. That's what Germany was doing. That's what Russia was doing. That's why for Russia, this expansionist idea is very much linked to access to war seas. And that's the basics of Russian foreign policy. And it was the major pillar of Russian foreign policy during the Catherine the Great or Peter the Great, you know, to have access to seas and uh, still remains today. If you look what Russia is trying to do in Syria and people are asking, what the hell they are doing in Syria? Why Russia, for the God's sake, wants to be part of this mess? The answer is Mediterranean Sea. They want to have a military base in the Mediterranean Sea. You know, somebody offered me an interesting book um, about Russian imperial archives that was written by one British um, scholar and was studying the Russian archives, uh, imperial archives. In 1914, what was the general staff of Russian Empire dis discussing? <coughs> what was their major concern and major plans? In 1914, I'm talking about three years before the Russian Empire collapsed and the Soviet Union, whatever, the revolution and the Three years before, Russian general staff is discussing how they are going to take Constantinople. This something. Okay? Whole planning was about how we are going to take Istanbul. In a flea market in Georgia, I bought a fascinating pocket dictionary. Uh, Russian Turkish military uh, phrase book for Red Army officers. It's a very funny book because it starts from stop and get off the horse. <laughs> but interesting part in that is that it's published in 1940. 1940. Stalin, Uncle Joe, thinking exactly the same to go and occupy Constantinopolis. You know? And it's a pocket size that you can put it in your pocket, so if you are occupying force and you have to communicate with locals, you have to have some phrases, right? And if you go on the, of the Connecticut Avenue, there is a great um, Hillwood Museum, uh, with a great collection and artifacts even from Russia, you see how the Catherine the Great or the later rulers were seeing all that process through the art. Because access to warm seas, which was the Bosphorus and Mediterranean, was a major point, and everything else that was happening was built to justify it. 
So guess what was the reason that Russians went to Ukraine now? Official reason. Defending Russian speakers. What was the reason in Georgia? Same, defending the Russian speakers. What was the Catherine the Great's uh, war in Crimea many, many years ago? <coughs> defending Christians. You know? It's the same justification of their policies. Major ob objective is access to seas. Everything else is justification of that policy. You are going to save the Christians, you are going to save the Russian speakers, or you are save, going to save somebody in some form. So if you are going to go somewhere and save them, how are you going to do that? And then comes the neighborhood into play, because Russian objective is not to control Georgia or Ukraine or Moldova or Belarus. Russian objective is to go to the warm seas, and for that you have to take control Chechnya, Georgia, Turkey, and go down there. And if you, some of you have extra time to read some fascinating books, one of them is uh, Autobiography of Trotsky, or Biography of Trotsky, which starts as a quick quite big and fat book, but it starts Trotsky riding the uh, train with his uh, assistant and dictating the telegram. And this telegram, he argues that the Soviet Red Army has to attack British forces in India. And you would think, India, really? I mean, we are kind of talking about revolution in the European part of Russia, but that's even Trotsky and Stalin and others were thinking on these categories that, you know, this is not war about this territory that we are into, but warm seas going down to Indian Ocean, going down to the Bosphorus, and going to the, to the Northern Seas and the, in the Baltics. So the Baltic Sea, Black Sea, Mediterranean Sea, Indian Ocean, these are the destinations for us. Not Georgia, not Ukraine, not Moldova, not Belarus, not Estonia, or any other former Soviet countries. And that policy you can track starting from the Tsars and Queens of Russia up to Putin. And that's the Russian legacy, the foreign policy legacy as well, that has an enormous detailed continuity. And when we, people were telling me here when I was ambassador that, yeah, Russia is misbehaving, in the end of the day it's meddling in its neighborhood. I was trying to tell that to everybody that this is not about neighborhood. You have to understand that neighborhood is a transition to something else. You have to control Georgia if you want to go to Turkey. You have to occupy Baltic countries if you want to have a proper access to the uh, Baltic Sea, and etc. Et so, and then when the Russians went to Syria, which was pretty much out of their neighborhood for sure, people said, wow, wow, Syria, really, why? And then when American uh, election was, I don't know, hacked, spoofed, whatever, <laughs> uh, you know, people started to understand that it's not about Russian neighborhood. But why Russian neighborhood matters? <coughs> because Russian neighborhood is the front line of containing Russian expansionist policies. This is a really a front line. If you want and we want to have a, a reliable partner not threatening anybody. And believe me, we want much more than you can imagine because they are our neighbors. So we want a normal trading partner like Germany and France that used to have a wars and God knows what not, but now they are normal trading partners. They are together in the EU. They are backbone of the EU. After Britain will be gone. Um, so we want a, that kind of relationship. And it's in our interest that people in Russia will change their policies and will focus on themselves and will not be focusing on expansion. And in other 
assumption that I was talking about how people perceive their role in the country, Russian nation is ready to suffer for motherland, which is not something that they will benefit. I mean, my country blew up the American tank, great, you know, hurrah, Putin is a great guy. And by the way, I'm hungry. And they don't see the correlation between their hunger and what Putin is doing outside. And they never saw it before, during the Stalin or Soviet, or during the um, period of Tsars. And this is a very serious issue to have in mind, because when we're talking about transformation of the Russian society, it's much more difficult than one can perceive sending NDI, IRI, and uh, a bunch of other instruments that the uh, US has, and telling them it's good for you. It's much more difficult. But frontline of transforming Russia into the viable, reliable, responsible international player and the partner lies on addressing those issues starting from the Russia's immediate neighborhood. That's why the successful and democratic Ukraine, <coughs> successful and democratic Georgia, successful and, uh, uh, and democratic you know, Belarus, Moldova, Armenia, Azerbaijan, is essential for transforming Russia as a responsible player. Otherwise, they will be always tempted to expand as much as they can, and it doesn't matter. It's not about Putin. Putin matters now, but who will be after Putin will have the same tendencies. And if deterrence worked then and produced stability in the world, more or less, I think that new deterrence is overdue, which has to start by supporting nations around the Russia to be peaceful, safe, and democratic. I'll just stop here, and I'll try to answer your questions.